بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We want to prove that the sum a to the i2 pi m squared n where m is from 0 to n minus 1. This is equal to 1 half square root of n 1 plus i 1 plus i to the minus n where n is a positive integer. We start by defining the function g of u where u is from 0 to 1. g of u is summation m from 0 to n minus 1 e to the i2 pi u plus m squared divided by n. As we can see, the desired sum is function g of u evaluated at u equals 0. g of 0 is the sum we want to evaluate. Let's check g of 1. We replace this u by 1. Let's do a change of summation index. n is equal to m plus 1. When small m is 0, small n is 1. When small m is big n minus 1, small n is big n. So we have this sum. This summation here, we can write it from 0 to n minus 1, but this summation starts from 1. So we need to subtract the term at 0, which is 1. And this summation stops at n minus 1. This one stops at n. So we need to add to this summation the term at small n equal to big n. And this is e to the i 2 pi big n. Big n is an integer, so this is 1. Minus 1 plus 1, this is 0. g of 1 is equal to this sum here, which is g of 0. If we define function g in such a way on the closed interval from 0 to 1, g of 0 is g of 1. Let's imagine that function g is periodized. We extend function g of u as a periodic function with period 1 to the whole real line. g of u is one periodic function. We can express it using the Fourier series. The complex Fourier series is a summation over integer k of ck. Those are the Fourier series coefficients e to the i 2 pi k over the period. And the period is 1 times u. What are those coefficients? They are 1 over the period. That's 1. And then we have an integration over the period. We can take it from 0 to 1, g of u times e to the minus i 2 by k u d. Note that if we are interested in g of 0, then this exponential when u is 0 is 1. And our sum of interest is equal to the sum of those complex Fourier series coefficients. What is ck? Insert the expression for g of u, which is this summation here. This is a finite sum. We can interchange integration and finite sum because integration is linear. We have summation m from 0 to big N minus 1, integration from 0 to 1. Then we have e to the i 2 pi u plus m squared over big N, and then e to the minus i 2 pi k u. Let's do change of variables. Let t be u plus m minus n k over 2. When u is equal to 0, t is m minus n k over 2. When u is equal to 1, t is this lower integration limit plus 1. We need to replace this u plus m by t plus n k over 2. And this u here is replaced by t minus m plus n k over 2. Expand the square. This is t squared plus n squared k squared over 4. And then we have 2 times t times n k over 2. That's n k t. Then we have three terms from here. Minus 2 pi k t plus i 2 pi k m minus i 2 pi n k squared divided by 2. Let's see what we have. We have e to the i 2 pi t squared over m. Then we have e to the i 2 pi n goes with n k t. We have here the same term but with a minus sign. So this will go with this. Then we have e to the i 2 pi n squared divided by n, that's n k squared over 4. And from here we have minus n k squared over 2. So this will give us e to the i 2 pi minus 1 over 4 n k squared, which is this term here. The remaining term is e to the i 2 pi k m, e to the i 2 pi times an integer, that's equal to 1. This is the integrand after doing this change of variables. If this is the real line, then when small m is equal to 0, we are integrating from minus nk over 2 to minus nk over 2 plus 1. When small m is equal to 1, we are integrating from minus nk over 2 plus 1 to minus nk over 2 plus 2. So we are integrating over here and then over here. This continues all the way. When small m is big n minus 1, we are integrating from minus nk over 2 plus n minus 1 to minus nk over 2 plus n. Rather than having a sum and an integral, we can just say that we have an integral starting from minus nk over 2 all the way to minus nk over 2 plus big N. And the integrand is e to the i 2 pi t squared over n minus i 2 pi nk squared over 4 dt. And note that there is no t here. So we can split this exponential into two exponentials, and the one that is free from t can be taken outside. The complex Fourier series coefficient ck is now given by this e to the i 2 pi nk squared over 4 times the integral of e to the i 2 pi t squared over n dt, and we are integrating from minus nk over 2 to minus nk over 2 plus n. The summation we are interested in is simply the sum of those complex Fourier series coefficients over integer k. Let's write this sum as a sum over the even integers and another over the odd integers. In the first summation, 
we take this expression here, replacing each k by 2k. So this exponential becomes e to the minus i 2 pi n over 4. Then when we replace k by 2k in square, we get 4k squared. 4 goes with 4. We have e to the minus i 2 pi times an integer. That's 1. So the outside factor is equal to 1. In this case, the limits of integration when we replace k by 2k become minus nk as the lower limit and minus nk plus n as the upper limit. In this summation, we replace k by 2k plus 1. The outside factor is e to the minus i 2 pi n and k over 2 squared. Now k is replaced by 2k plus 1. So here we are squaring k plus 1 half. This gives k squared plus k plus 1 fourth. e to the minus i 2 pi n k squared and e to the minus i 2 pi n k, these two terms are equal to 1. We are left with e to the minus i 2 pi n times 1 fourth. This is e to the i pi over 2 the power minus n. This is i to the power minus n. In this summation, this factor becomes i to the minus n. We need also to replace each k in the limits of integration by 2k plus 1. This is now the sum of the coefficients of the complex Fourier series. We have this summation. k is from minus infinity to infinity. If k is 0, we are integrating from 0 to n. If k is equal to minus 1, we are integrating from n to 2n. If k is 1, we are integrating from minus n to 0, and so on and so forth. As k goes over the integer values, we integrate over the real line. Thus, this sum of integrals is simply the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i 2 pi t squared over n. We can do the same here. If k is 0, we are integrating from minus n over 2 to n over 2. If k is equal to 1, we are integrating from minus 3 n over 2 to minus n over 2. If k is minus 1, we are integrating from n over 2 to 3 n over 2, and so on. The sum of the integrals is simply the integration over r of e to the i 2 pi t squared over n. This integral is the same as that summation of ck. k is an integer, which is the quantity of interest, g0. This is 1 plus i to the minus n, and then we need to evaluate this integral. Before doing this, let's do change of variables. Let x be equal to t times the square root of 2 pi over n. As t tends to minus infinity, x tends to minus infinity. As t tends to infinity, x tends to infinity. dt is square root n over 2 by dx. And this term here, 2 pi over nt squared, is x squared. Our summation becomes this. We are integrating an even function. So we can integrate from 0 to infinity and multiply by 2. So this is this 2 here. Our sum of interest is square root 2 over pi times square root n, 1 plus i to the minus n, and then we have this integral. To finish off the problem, we need to evaluate this integral. Consider the integral gamma, which is a contour integral in the complex plane over this contour C of e to the minus half z squared dz. Our contour is we move along the real axis in the positive direction, a distance r, so we go from 0 to r, and then we move along the circle with radius r. We move to this point such that this line segment makes angle 45 degrees. And so this point is r times 1 minus i over square root 2. Then we go back to the origin along this line with slope minus 1. The integrand is analytic. There are no balls. And so this contour integral should give us 0. And we can write it as the sum of three integrals. If we move along the real axis, our variable is v, is real. And we are simply integrating from 0 to r e to the minus 1 half times v squared. Then we move along this circular arc. Every complex number here is r in magnitude, and then there is an angle e to the i phi. And phi ranges from 0 to minus pi over 4. Alternatively, I will write e to the minus i theta, and theta is from 0 to pi over 4. So this is z along this circular arc. dz is minus i r e to the minus i theta d theta, Finally, we have gamma 3, which is the integral over this line segment. This line segment, z is equal to 1 minus i minus eta, where eta is a real number. If eta is 0, we are at the origin. If eta is r over square root 2, we are at this point here. Since this is the direction of integration, we put a minus sign, and then eta changes from 0 to r over square root 2. dz is 1 minus eta d eta. Let's deal with each one of those integrals in turn. Our first integral, when we take the limit as r tends to infinity, let's call it gamma 1 tilde. Gamma 1 tilde squared is the square of this integral. The square of the integral is the double integral 
from 0 to infinity, 0 to infinity, e to the minus half v squared plus w squared dv dw. We evaluate this integral by changing from rectangular coordinates to polar coordinates. Specifically, we put v is equal to y cosine phi and w is equal to y sine phi. In this case, v squared plus w squared is y squared dv dw using the Jacobian of transformation is y dy dv. Our integration will be y, the magnitude, is from 0 to infinity, and the angle is from 0 to pi over 2, because here we are integrating over the first quadrant. The integral with respect to the angle is pi over 2. Then we can replace 1 half y squared by, say, alpha, and this will be integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus alpha d alpha. This gives 1. Gamma 1 tilde squared is pi over 2, so gamma 1 tilde, which is the limit of gamma 1 as r tends to infinity, is square root pi over 2. Let's investigate this second integral. Specifically, let's study its magnitude. By applying the triangle inequality for integrals, the magnitude of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the magnitude of the integral. We take the magnitude of each term here. Note that I took this term, e to the minus half. We have r squared, and then we have e to the minus i2 theta. This is equal to e to the minus half r squared, and this is cosine 2 theta minus i sine 2 theta. When we take magnitudes, the magnitude of minus i is 1. The magnitude of e to the minus i theta is 1. The magnitude of e to the i r squared over 2 sine 2 theta is 1. Magnitude of r is itself. r is a positive real number, so we take it outside. And then we have the magnitude of this. This exponential is also positive, so its magnitude is itself. Now we have that the magnitude of gamma 2 is upper bounded by r times the integral from 0 to pi over 4 e to the minus 1 half r squared cosine 2 theta. We need to do further upper bounding before taking the limit as r tends to infinity. We exploit the concavity of the cosine function on the interval from 0 to pi over 2. Cosine x has a first derivative minus sine x. The second derivative is minus cosine x. If x is between 0 and pi over 2, cosine is non-negative and minus cosine x is non-positive. This means that on this interval, the cosine function is a concave function. Recall that if h is concave, then if we take two points in the domain of h, let's say alpha and beta, h of lambda alpha plus 1 minus lambda beta, this is a convex combination of alpha and beta, lambda is between 0 and 1. This is greater than or equal to lambda h of alpha plus 1 minus lambda h of beta for a concave function. Cosine is concave. We check this by investigating the sine of the second derivative. Thus, for every lambda between 0 and 1, we have cosine lambda times pi over 2, which is this endpoint, plus 1 minus lambda times 0, which is this endpoint. This is, from the definition of a concave function, greater than or equal to lambda cosine pi over 2 plus 1 minus lambda cosine 0. Cosine pi over 2 is 0. Cosine 0 is 1. So we have cosine lambda pi over 2 is greater than or equal to 1 minus lambda, and lambda is between 0 and 1. Note that in our integral, theta is from 0 to pi over 4. So let lambda be theta divided by pi over 4. In this case, if we divide theta by pi over 4, we get a number in 0 and 1. So replace lambda in our inequality by theta divided by pi over 4, which is 4 theta over pi. We get that cosine 2 theta is greater than or equal to 1 minus 4 theta over pi. Multiply both sides of this inequality by minus 1. So minus cosine 2 theta is less than or equal to minus 1 plus 4 theta over pi. If we multiply by r squared over 2, then we have that minus 1 half r squared cosine 2 theta is less than or equal to r squared over 2 minus 1 plus 4 theta over pi. We can further upper bound the magnitude of gamma 2 by replacing the exponential by another exponential. In the exponent, we have minus r squared over 2 plus r squared over 2 times 4 theta over pi. We can take e to the minus r squared over 2 outside the integral, and this is an integral with respect to theta, and we can evaluate it. This is e to the 2r squared over pi theta. We need to divide by this factor here. And then we need to evaluate the exponential at the lower and upper limits of integration. If theta is 0, this is 1. If theta is pi over 4, then we get e to the r squared over 2. So this is our integral. And let's not forget that there is this outside factor. This will give us pi over 2. And then r divided by r squared, this is 1 over r. If we multiply this by the bracket, we get the first term is 1 over r, which tends to 0 as r tends to infinity. And the second term is 1 over r e to the minus r squared over 2, which again tends to 0 as r tends to infinity. This magnitude here, which is a non-negative quantity, is upper bounded, and the upper bound tends to 0 as r tends to infinity. This means that this integral here tends to 0 as r tends to infinity. So far, 
this first integral as r tends to infinity is square root pi over 2. The second integral tends to 0 as r tends to infinity. What about the third one, which is gamma 3, 1 minus i squared is 1 minus 1 minus 2i. We have minus 2i, and we have here minus 1 half. So the exponent becomes i eta squared. We can take this outside the integral. We have integration from 0 to r over square root 2 e to the minus i eta squared d eta. Recall that the integral we are interested in to solve our original problem is the integral from 0 to infinity e to the i x squared dx, which is like this integral when we take the limit as r tends to infinity. It is just that this integral is multiplied by this factor here. Because we are integrating a function that is analytic, the contour integral is equal to 0. As r tends to infinity, this guy is 0. This guy is a square root pi over 2. And this guy becomes minus 1 times i, the integral of 0 to infinity e to the i eta squared d eta. So this integral here times 1 minus i is square root pi over 2. The integral is square root pi over 2 divided by 1 minus i. If we multiply numerator and denominator by 1 plus i, we get that this integral here is square root pi over 2, and then we have 1 plus i divided by 2. That's it. The sum we are interested in from the previous page is square root 2 over pi times the square root n times 1 plus i to the minus n, then this integral. Now this integral, it has this factor, square root pi over 2. This time is this will give us 1. We are left with square root n, and then this 1 half, and then 1 plus i, and then 1 plus i to the minus n. This is the value of this summation here. If n is divisible by 4, i to the minus n is 1. So this bracket becomes 2. That will go with this 2, and our sum is square root n times 1 plus i. If n is 1 modulo 4, then this term is like i to the minus 1, which is minus i. So these two brackets become 1 plus i times 1 minus i, which is 2. 2 goes with this 2, and we are left with square root n. If n is an even number that is not divisible by 4, then i to the minus n is minus 1, and this bracket is 0. This summation is equal to 0 in this case. Finally, if n is congruent to 3 modulo 4, then i to the minus n is like i to the minus 3, which is i. And now the two brackets are 1 plus i squared. This is 2i. 2 goes with 2, and this summation becomes i times the square root of n.